Radio EcoShock. Satellite shots of the treasured Brazilian Amazon reveal a massive fire and smoke this year. It is heartbreaking. No scientist knows the Amazon better than our guest, Dr. Thomas Lovejoy. Thomas has won so many awards, he's appeared in nature documentaries, he's advised three presidents. He is the father of biological diversity and helped found conservation biology. Thomas Lovejoy, welcome back to Radio EcoShock. Well, great to be with you. How long did you operate a research base in the Amazon rainforest? So I first set foot in the Amazon in 1965, uh, but then in 1979 I started a long-term research program to really understand what happens when you break a forest into fragments. So that's now 40 years and ongoing. And when you began, did you imagine the forest destruction we are seeing now? It was it was really hard to imagine. You know, by the late 70s and into the mid-80s, there began to be some major deforestation. But prior to that, most of it had been along the single highway from Brasilia, the capital, to Belang, the port city. And Thomas, what is your synthesis of the latest news about fires in the Amazon this past summer? Well, I think they are the consequence of flashed budgets for enforcement, uh, as well as rhetoric encouraging people to uh, go and deforest and, and try and bring some economic return, even though it's actually very trivial. Are fire losses in the region greater this year than in years past? How serious is this? Well, there have been years when it's been worse, but it is a big kick up from a year ago. Uh, And that basically reflects both the lack of resources for serious enforcement as well as some of the government rhetoric. Yeah, it was kind of free-for-all of settlers, I think, in the 1990s. And then recent governments have tried to to rein it in and and do some protection, but that seems to be all blown away. Very much like Trump is throwing away environmental regulations in the United States, Uh, Bolsonaro is doing the same thing. Well, to be fair, a lot was accomplished, which is still there. And while there are incursions here and there, you know, literally 50% of the Brazilian Amazon, and indeed of the Amazon as a whole, is in existing conservation areas or demarcated indigenous reserves. Uh, And that's an incredible achievement when you stop to think that the Amazon is actually equivalent in area to the 48 contiguous United States. That is amazing and a little bit hopeful. So do you think enough carbon is being released from vegetation burning in the Amazon to make global warming even worse? Well, I mean, anytime you burn down some rainforest, you are contributing to an increase in in global warming, uh, no question about it. What really worries me and some other scientists who are familiar with it is what this may be doing to the hydrological cycle of the Amazon, which basically enables the Amazon to generate 50% of its rainfall internally. We know that at some point, too much deforestation can lead to a tipping point and there would be dieback of the forest in the south and the east and in a bit of the center of the Amazon just because there would no longer be sufficient rainfall. This tipping point really interests me. Do we know how close we are to it and and what would happen? So Carlos Nobre uh, from Brazil and I published a piece a year, year and a half ago uh, in which we said that we think that nowadays with climate change also bringing pressure and extensive use of fire bringing pressure, that the tipping point is somewhere in the vicinity of 20, maybe 25 percent deforestation. And Brazilian deforestation is pushing pretty close to 20 percent. And more worrisome, we are seeing what Carlos and I interpret as first flickers of the tipping point in historic droughts in 2005 to in 2010 and 2015-16. 
So they're pretty close to it. The good news, of course, is if they take it seriously, they'll do some very active reforestation and build back a margin of safety. Do you think it just takes human action to approach that tipping point, or is it possible that global climate change could also push the Amazon towards savanna almost no matter what Brazilian people do? Well, I mean, climate change, human-generated climate change, is part of what's pushing the system at the moment, but it's not all by itself. And among other things, the last thing you want to do is have some more forests go because of the tipping point and have all that carbon end up in the atmosphere. But can we presume that the wave of fires this year are probably mostly set by humans rather than natural sources like lightning? So rainforest basically does not burn naturally. If you have lightning strikes in a rainforest, you know, whatever tree gets zapped is, in, is you know, in trouble and sayonara, but uh, you just don't get natural fires in rainforests. That's true. We've seen that on the west coast of British Columbia, where there are forests that just have never burned in thousands of years because it's just too wet and it doesn't happen. That's right. So it's very similar. Right. So Europeans just threatened to withhold a trade deal unless action is taken by Brazil's government against these Amazon fires. And journalist David Wallace-Wells said something I thought was important. He says, a threat to apply the same tools of leverage and sanction and shame to crimes of climate as have been applied in the past to violations of human rights and territorial sovereignty. So I'm wondering, are we seeing some promise there of nation-to-nation action to prevent the worst abuses of the environment. Your thoughts? So I think there are two ways this can affect the future. Uh, One is withholding some economic uh, opportunities, such as was being talked about prior to the G7 meeting. But the other is when the international community comes together recognizes that we can hardly expect Brazil and the other Amazon nations to take care of the Amazon all by themselves uh, and create a mechanism, some multilateral mechanism, uh, as was done in the 1990s uh, through the World Bank. Also, Julie Turkowitz in the New York Times questions the seriousness of this year's fires in the Amazon, and the argument goes like this. It's mostly farmers and loggers burning slash in Brazil. They are not destroying virgin rainforest, but that kind of original forest is burning in Africa's Angola and Congo with no big uproar. Perhaps we should look there instead. I don't know. I'm not sure I buy that argument. What do you think? Well, first of all, forest burning, rainforest burning anywhere in the world is not a good idea. It just isn't a good idea. And it tends to go on year after year without a lot of attention to it. So it's a good thing that this popped up the way it did, because it it enables people to understand that, you know, there's serious changes going on, which are not good for the forest, not good for biodiversity, and not good for climate. Science is under threat in many countries, including in the United States and Australia. Canadian climate science hasn't recovered after a 10-year attack on funding climate research. How are international scientists coping now that they're in the Amazon and they're trying to do research with the new government? Are there problems or are things still going along well? Well, the, the science, the government science budget in Brazil has been essentially cut in half. So you can imagine the impacts that is having. That doesn't mean all, all science you know, stops dead. Some has non-government funding or whatever, but it's just not a very smart thing to do. Because, you know, the, the root word for science is to know. And if we cease to pay attention to what we can learn, uh, we're setting ourselves up for all kinds of problems. Yes, we could have some real, well, we're already having some real surprises, and uh, that's with the best science that we have to date. So we've got to keep up the research in the Amazon, I would say. Well, yeah, in the Amazon, you know, and what I was saying applies to research Brazil-wide, actually. Right. And the Brazilian government belatedly announced a 60-day ban on burning in the Amazon, and they are sending in the troops 
Will that help? Is it enough? What else could the government do? Well, of course it will help. Uh, I do worry that legitimate landholders who want to use fire to clear the leftover vegetation from last year to prepare the fields for another year of crops are going to be penalized by this. But obviously, the important thing to do here is not just try and curb the illegal deforestation, but actually create an a new vision for the Amazon in which development is around its its incredible biodiversity and looks for ways to understand that better and turn it into things which are useful for the world. I mean, we already have, you know, cacao and we have rubber and curare and quinine and, you know, some other medicines. Uh, that come from that biology, but we've only just scratched the surface. Yes, I kind of look at the Amazon as kind of a reserve of biodiversity. We don't know even yet all of the creatures that are there, a lot of exploring to be done, and without that well to replenish us, the planet would be much poorer or even in danger. Well, that's completely true. So, I mean, it's really important to understand that one truly important way to to think about the Amazon and that forest is as a gigantic library for the life sciences. Yeah, I don't think the public really understands that biodiversity is in crisis and that crisis is developing right at the foundation point of life. Uh, Do you think we're in crisis? How serious is it? Well, there's no, no question globally that we're in a crisis. The UN report that came out in May basically warned that we could easily lose a million species in the next 20 or 30 years unless we change some of the negative trends. Again, the Brazilians, some Brazilians argue that the Americans developed their West. Settlers cut down the trees, planted crops, or ran cattle despite the original inhabitants. Why shouldn't Brazil be allowed to do the same with her wilderness? Well, first of all, we haven't lost very much biological diversity in the process. We're lucky in the sense of having, you know, less diverse, simpler ecosystems. But it's also easy to oversimplify what went on in the past uh, in North America. And, you know, there are the equivalent of demarcated indigenous areas in different parts of the United States, no question about it. This is Radio Ecoshock reporting on the state of the planet. I'm Alex Smith, honored to have as our guest the premier scientist of the Amazon and world conservation, Dr. Thomas Lovejoy. Thomas, if the rest of us switched away from eating beef and using leather and purchasing soy, would that help preserve the Amazon? So I think we need to be doing those kinds of things, not just for the Amazon, but actually for the future of life on Earth, uh, because there are, you know, we're pushing 8 billion people now, and there are going to be at least another couple more. And we just need to change our lifestyles in ways that will create a much gentler footprint on the planet. So, Thomas, please take a couple of minutes, if you can, to really explain the strategy that you would endorse to save what is left in the great rainforest. We'd like to learn from you. So I think what one needs to do is, one, engage a a major multilateral institution like the Inter-American Development Bank to, you know, mobilize a program that can be funded by other nations. Um, That's step number one. Step number two, I think, is actually having a new vision for the future of the Amazon, where, for example, we recognize that rivers are the best transport systems and always have been, and highways generally just lead to destruction. We need to think about hydroelectric installations that don't block sediment flow from the Andes downstream, that don't block the migratory catfish species, which have life cycles that span from the Andes to the estuary and back. And then I see incredible opportunity if there was a serious investment in exploring that biological diversity uh, in partnership with industry, looking for new medicines, new fungicides, 
uh, other new biological products, which by definition would be biodegradable and renewable. Right. You know, even pharmaceutical research is a multi-billion dollar industry, and that could be Brazil's industry. Well, it certainly could. I mean, they they did try it once about 15, 20 years ago, um, but they didn't really partner sufficiently with industry, so it never quite took off. Uh, but I think, it, you know, this is something that could turn all of this into incredible financial wealth as well as or based on the biological wealth. And what about the argument that getting and expanding into the Amazon is in a way Brazil's social valve to help people who are in poverty or have no other resources as their population also expands. And, that you know, so it would be more difficult to manage society if they actually tried to protect the Amazon more. You know, first of all, Brazil is a really big country. Uh, it's, it's essentially half of South America. So space is not in short supply. But the really important thing is the hydrological cycle whereby the Amazon makes half of its own rainfall. Uh, if it gets undercut and you have a tipping point, which I think is close at hand, in the south and the east of the Amazon, part of the central Amazon, you would have dieback of the forest. An immense pool of carbon would go up in the atmosphere. Huge amounts of biodiversity would be lost. And so while one can sympathize in one sense, in somebody who just wants to cut some forest to clear a field, uh, at a certain point, that pushes the whole system over into a much less beneficial future. And was there some suggestion that if the Amazon reaches that tipping point, it could also affect global systems such as uh, the creation of rainfall in Africa? Well, I'm not so sure about how that links to global patterns of moisture, but there's no question that the Amazon is an important flywheel in South America's climate system. And moisture from the Amazon, you know, benefits agriculture in central Brazil, benefits reservoirs in cities of the south of Brazil, actually goes as far as Paraguay and Uruguay and northern Argentina. So you're really playing with essentially a continental climate system. Well, this year, there has been some public and political reaction to fires in the Amazon rainforest. What was your uh, personal reaction, and are you trying to keep track of the developments sort of day to day? Well, you know, not surprisingly, I am on top of it as much as anybody can be on a regular basis and trying to come up with solutions and better outcomes. Uh, I think one thing that's very encouraging is how strong Brazilian public opinion was about the need to address this problem. I mean, people were literally in the streets as of Friday a week ago. Do you feel that the biodiversity movement and concern is getting lost in the climate change debate and, and movement, or, or are they working together? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it could easily get overshadowed, uh, but if you really stop to think about how it all works, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere from destroyed and de degraded nature is roughly equal to what remains in extant nature. So that's a pretty shocking statement to be able to make, and that's the shocking part. So with so much CO2 in the atmosphere from destroyed ecosystems, if we actually got really engaged at ecosystem restoration, we could literally bring down the level of CO2 in the atmosphere to something which is, is much more reasonable from a climate perspective and make the future for biodiversity much more secure. And basically that means recognizing that this planet works as a linked physical and biological system, that it is in fact a living planet, and that each and every one of us can individually contribute to ecosystem restoration through planting the right kind of tree uh, or helping restore a coastal wetland. So my hope here is this will be a great wake-up moment for society about the way the planet works and the importance of biodiversity.
We certainly need that wake-up moment. Now, a lot of your work has been to protect species from extinction. What do you make of the new Extinction Rebellion movement? Well, I, you know, I, I'm encouraged that there are some young people out there who really are upset about the thought of extinctions and ending what basically are four billion year lineages of, of evolution, because that's what happens every time a species goes extinct. So I hope there will be a lot more of it. And as we wrap up here, as you head toward 80 years on this planet, what is the plan? Do you hope to work your field until the end? Do you have certain projects you hope to complete? Or is retirement really an option for you? So retirement's not in my vocabulary. (laughs) Uh, And, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that need to be done in, in conservation and science. I've got at least three more books I want to get out. So my days are full. No doubt. And, you know, you have been so generous sharing your time with our listeners. Thank you very much, Thomas Lovejoy. And thank you all for caring. I'm Alex Smith for Radio EcoShock. Check out the Radio EcoShock website. We're at ecoshock.org.